It is my privilege to introduce Cliff and Allison Reynolds. We have uh, um, been a part of their team since probably the beginning part, and uh, they started in 2011 and, uh, in England, and they're going to share some great updates. One of the things that I'm sure they'll share uh, as they kind of finish up this time there in Swindon, uh, the church that they, tr that they planted there uh, is healthy and well. And so when they go back, they'll actually be starting a new church and a new place. And yet that comes with uh, great excitement, but great sorrow too. There's a mixed bag of emotions there as uh, think about that here. You know, I think about that as if I were starting West Hill and we get started and we get healthy and everything's going well. And then to pass it on to a healthy pastor and, and then to go back and to start a new church and a new place, uh, that would be challenging and hard. And so that kind of gives you a picture a little bit. Um, but uh, they're, they're wonderful people, and they give us lots of laughs in our family. And uh, there's a little bit of razzing that goes on. They always pick on Uncle Aaron. And, uh, but uh, I hope that you will be encouraged and challenged as you live out your faith where God has given you. And so if you would welcome Cliff and Allie um, to the stage here this morning. Well, it is great uh, to be here uh, with you this morning as we have the opportunity to share a little bit of an update uh, um, with you. We were here uh, on our last furlough two years ago, and so um, we'll just try to bring you up to date on uh, where things are uh, with us currently. Um, we are the, the Reynolds family, as, as Aaron mentioned, Cliff and Allie, and our four children, Caleb, Hope, Josiah, and Isaac. They've gotten a little bit taller in the last two years. Caleb has passed dad now. Hope has passed mom now. And we're just waiting for the other two to pass us as well. Um, but uh, we serve as missionaries uh, in the UK, in the country of England, uh, with the Association of Baptists for World Evangelism, and uh, we are involved in church planting, and I also serve as the field team leader for uh, five units, uh, ABWE units, um, on our field. We've been serving with ABWE for 15 years. We were appointed 15 years ago, and you can see on those pictures up there our rookie card. With Caleb, he's he's grown quite a bit since then. But um, and we've we've journeyed along. Um, so 15 years ago, we were appointed. 12 years ago, we were able to head to the field, and we were able to do our orientation. That was two years in a British church, learning about British culture and how to do church there. Um, and then after that point, we moved to our church plant, um, and that was 10 years ago that we were we moved to Swindon to start the church plant that we that Aaron just just mentioned about. Um, and then it was the day before we came on furlough um, that we were able to be a part of the graduation service there where we officially graduated that church, handed it over to the leadership there, and we were able to um, go on furlough and hope to be able to plant again. And God has just been so faithful over those years. Um, and that's what I hope you hear through this presentation is about God's faithfulness in the past, and therefore we can trust him um, that he will again be faithful. Um, our team in the UK has the following vision statement to fulfill the Great Commission by multiplying prayer, uh, disciples, leaders, and healthy evangelical churches in the United Kingdom, uh, which is a great need in a country where uh, we mentioned last time only about 3% of the population uh, knows Jesus as their Savior. And so we're just going to talk about uh, those four uh, different uh, areas, prayer, disciples, leaders, and healthy evangelical churches, and how we have been seeking to fulfill that vision. So we've been multiplying prayer, or hoping to multiply prayer, um, amongst the people there in, in England, in our church, um, through lots of different ways, but a couple, um, couple different ways. We had weekly prayer meetings, and those were often in our home, where we would come together and pray for the needs of the community, the needs for the church, and just a vision and leadership and guidance from the Lord as we continued m making those steps towards um, building that church there in Swindon. We also did a, a week-long prayer time each year, and this was always a highlight of our time, uh, where we would have... Um, the whole week would be set aside. We'd multiple times a day, we would go to different people's houses and we would pray together. And it was such a blessing because many times before the week was up, 
the Lord would answer, be faithful to answer some of those prayer requests that we were praying. And even those, those, day, those weekly ones as well, that would happen. By the end of the day, we would get reports from people how God had answered those prayers. Um, and so that was such an encouragement and such um, a, a kind of powerhouse for how we were able to, to plant that church was through prayer. But then through multiplying prayer amongst our supporters here in the States, through our prayer letters, we send those out quarterly now. Um, so if you haven't received those, um, uh, you can sign up on our, our back table uh, for those prayer updates, but we also have been trying to send out some prayer emails. Those are maybe prayer requests that are a little bit more urgent or something that's happening the next day that we were just asking for prayer, and then you can be a part of that event or whatever that was, uh, and then we were able to give an update on how the Lord worked and how you can continue to pray. So again, we just thank you for those prayers and encourage you if you're not a part of that or on that email list, make sure you get on that so you can be a part of praying for us. Uh, as we look towards the future, uh, just a few things, uh, three things in particular you could be praying for us as we look towards the new uh, work that God's calling us to. Uh, we are going to be going back to the mother church to be forming a new team to go with us, kind of a launch team um, to go into a, a new area uh, in the town of Swindon. And so if you could be praying for that team that God would be gathering, we don't have the team yet. We're going to be going, building relationships, casting a vision and seeking the Lord's um, help as we seek to uh, develop that team. Um, we also are praying that we would be able to move into the area. Um, it's about 20 minutes from where we currently live um, uh, and uh, praying that we might be able to find a house there. Uh, we've been looking over the past year and there's, I think, only been one house that's really been suitable for our family um, as we rent houses um, in, in the UK. And so, um, but we know God has answered prayers uh, before about that. So uh, we'd appreciate your prayers. And if he doesn't provide and open a door for that, that's fine. We can continue living uh, where we are currently. Uh, but then also uh, a place for us to meet uh, as a church. Uh, it's a new community. We'll be talking about it a little bit later uh, in, the, in the update here, um, but we'll need a place to be able to meet. Um, we don't have a church building. Um, there is no land available to be able to do that, nor the money or funds to be able to purchase something. And so we often meet in schools or community centers, and we're hoping that we'll be able to meet in a school that's currently there um, uh, called the Deanery. And so you could be praying uh, with us about that as well. Um, but God has been faithful uh, in the past to answer our prayers, and we know that he, and we are trusting that he will be faithful to answer our prayers as we continue to pray to him. So the next thing is multiplying disciples, and we've been doing that in lots of different ways. Um, what we, we talk about intentional gospel living, and that's basically just living our lives amongst the people that God has placed us, where he's placed us, um, in an intentional way to build relationships in order to share the gospel with them. Often this is the first opportunity for people to actually meet a Christian um, and a, a believer and to be able to inter be introduced to the church. Um, so we have been praying over the years that God would intersect our lives with those that he's working in, and he has been faithful to do that. Um, one of the current ways in which we are, are in doing intentional gospel living is through uh, American football. So Caleb, our oldest, has been playing American football there in Swindon on a community team. And uh, it's been such a joy to be alongside um, the, the families there and get to know them uh, with the intent of sharing the gospel, building those relationships. But it takes a lot of time. So it's not something we can just go and immediately share the gospel. We have to build the trust of the people. We have to build those relationships and show them that we really do care about them. So he's been playing for a, a little over two years, and um, it's been exciting to watch. It's exciting to see how God has opened those um, opportunities of conversation. One of those ways is through um, some of the home games, one of the first ones especially. We, we invited our church to come out and cheer on Caleb. Now, most of the people in the church know nothing about American football, nor care about American football, but they care about Caleb. So they came along, and it, you can see the bottom picture. Um, there was about 30 to 35 people from our church that came. Our church is not that large, so it was a large percentage of our church. And the amazing part was that we could just constantly tell people that's our church family. Um, and it was important for them to see that because for many of the British people, church is irrelevant. Um, it doesn't matter to them. It's something that you would go to maybe way in the past. But to show them what a living church family looks like was very important for, for um, that, 
being able to open up those gospel conversations. Um, and so we even had people from other, the other teams asking, who are all those people over there? How many parents do you have? And they were like, oh, well, that's just all for one kid. <laughs> and so um, that was really exciting to be able to talk through with them. Um, and it was really exciting, even as we've been on furlough, one of the other coaches, um, they had needed some help. Um, at one of the events they were running. And they actually wrote to us and said, is there any way that your church gang could come along and help? So that just shows that they're seeing a difference. They're seeing the, the, the family feel, the people serving in lots of different ways, and that's opened up opportunities. We've built relationships with the coaches as well. Um, one of the coaches we've even been able to have at our house. We've invited him to church events. He's come along to some of our outreach events. And also we had a Cedarville team that came and did a drama, a John drama, and he came to that. So we're really excited about those opportunities and continuing to build that relationship and share the love of Christ with him. Another way um, that we've been doing intentional living is um, through an art cafe. So I have an art talent and I haven't been able to use it for quite some time um, as I've been raising children, but now they're old enough that I can start enjoying it once again. And so we've been able to use that um, to be able to have a art cafe where people come along and they bring their creative projects and we work on those together. But it was just an opportunity for people to come back together after COVID to open up conversations. And the goal is to be able to have that as kind of like a informal counseling time um, amongst the people. And we've had a lot of reception. One lady came along. Uh, she was a part of a, a friend from someone at church who had been trying to reach out to her for a long time. She came along to our art cafe, realized that church people aren't so different, so weird, so strange. Um, and so that helped her to come through the door of the church. Uh, and then we were able to do an evangelistic um, outreach with her, a, a, a course, and she came to know Christ, which was really exciting. And a lot of times we need those baby steps to get people through the door of the church because someone that doesn't know Christ to coming to church, that is a huge step. And so these are ways that we've been able to have kind of baby steps. Uh, we also seek to uh, share the gospel, to reach out into our community. Uh, a few different ways that we have done that. Um, uh, we have a, what's called a 3 2 one course that we will run uh, periodically with people who are interested in finding out more about Christianity. It's a three-week course uh, that just shares uh, about what Christianity is, who Jesus is, how people can have a relationship with him, why they need to have a relationship with him. Um, and uh, it's been great. Uh, the lady she just mentioned uh, had gone through that course, um, and we've seen uh, real uh, God answer our prayers in bringing people uh, to faith um, through that course. We also uh, have continued to be involved in school ministry. We weren't able to do that over COVID. Last time we were here, we were just coming out of COVID. We weren't sure if we were going to have opportunities, and uh, up in the top uh, uh, right corner there, you can see a picture of us doing an assembly, again, in one of the local schools. Caleb was even able to help uh, with that one uh, this last time. And then we've had some other outreach uh, opportunities as well, uh, events that we've uh, put on, the light event that we do at Halloween. Uh, we have Christmas caroling down in the bottom corner, outdoor Christmas caroling in the community uh, where our church is, uh, as well as a games uh, night, um, which is up in the top uh, middle there. Now, a lot of that was focusing on trying to bring people that don't know Christ um, to be introduced to Jesus. Uh, and so a lot of evangelism. But the discipleship part as well, we wanted to make sure that we are helping our people that know the Lord grow deeper. Uh, we do that through lots of different ways. Um, Cliff does that through preaching and teaching. Uh, we have weekly growth groups as well um, that meet in different homes so where we dive into the Word of God together. We have Sunday school for the children that they can come along. And, and many people have come to the church because of that, having something for the children to be able to, to get to know God as well through that. And just this past year, we've been able to uh, start a youth growth group, which is exciting. We've always had lots of children in our church, but we haven't had a lot of teens. And so we were just able to have, have a group, um, the group in the bottom right-hand corner, I think that is for you guys. Um, and that uh, that's our, our youth growth group, um, a lot of fun, but they really want to dive into the Word of God together as well and encourage each other in their growth, as many of their friends and people at school do not know Christ at all. So that's been exciting to be able to see. And not only do we want to uh, be making disciples among the people that we are going to reach, but as parents, uh, we want to see our children growing in the Lord. 
Uh, we want to be involved in seeing them following Jesus as well. And it's been a real joy uh, to watch them as they have grown in the Lord uh, over the years that we have uh, been there. Uh, they've been involved in serving in a variety of different ways from helping to set up. We, we don't have a, a church building you just come into. Uh, we have to set it up every single week because it's just in the school hall. Um, and they're there early uh, every Sunday morning helping uh, uh, set up everything, helping take everything down at the end. Um, uh, Caleb and um, the rest have been involved in sound and, and music and things as well, um, which has been a joy. And we also, uh, all four now, have made a profession of faith and followed the Lord in baptism. Uh, Josiah and um, Isaac just uh, being baptized at the end of last year, uh, which you can see uh, pictures of there as well. So just a joy to watch our, our children following the Lord um, as well. And those are all ways in which we've done that in the past. And we hope to do that again in the future, um, to be able to find ways in the community that we can find inroads into the community, which is one reason why we are hoping and praying to be able to move down into the community so we can get to know the neighbors and get to know the interest of those in that community. Um, and we're just got, knowing that God has been so incredibly faithful in the past, um, and therefore we can trust him again for the future that he's going to help us to be able to build disciples there as well. The third part of our statement is to multiply leaders, and so just to share a little bit of ways in which we've done that. One of our main prayer requests from last time that we were here two years ago was that um, God would raise up some other elders uh, to serve alongside Steve Mitchell, um, who is a full-time uh, pastor there uh, at the church plant, um, and you can see uh, um, God answered that prayer. Two new elders were appointed just in April. Uh, so the top left corner there, um, Steve uh, is in the kind of lighter, kind of pink uh, shirt. And then Nigel and Dave are the two new elders that have been appointed. And just encouraging to watch the way God has, has raised them up over the time that, that the church has been going. Nigel and his family moved to Swindon about a month before our family did. And they've been involved from the very beginning. Um, he was involved uh, on the youth team with us uh, and... Uh, was involved in some of the training that we were doing. And I remember when uh, I first asked him to do some of the youth talks, uh, which are about 10 minutes, you know, on, on a youth night. Um, he, he told me later, I didn't know this at the time, but later he said, I couldn't eat for two days before I did the 10-minute talk. He said, and, and I would physically get sick the day that I, <laughs> that I was going to be doing the talk. Um, to, to watch him grow from that point to the point that he's preached in our church. He leads one of our growth groups. He cares well for uh, the people of our church. And we also want to see uh, leaders not only develop just as elders, but throughout the, the church, uh, watching people use the gifts that God's given them to serve uh, the body of Christ. And that's been a joy to watch people serve in various ways uh, within the church family. And also, uh, we've had the opportunity to orient uh, two new missionary units to our field uh, over the last uh, several months. Uh, the Hilburn family uh, arrived last November, and then Krista Tritt arrived in January. And so uh, we were involved in helping them orient to the culture um, and getting them plugged in, helping them get set up. It's a very intense time for the people who are helping um, for those first couple months. And uh, we're just excited to see how God's going to use them um, in the future. So in the area of the future for le leaders, um, we are hoping to do again the same thing and trusting that God will help us to be able to develop leaders on all levels. But we are also trying to um, be able to be um, kind of a launch pad, a starting point for a church planting movement, uh, a church church planning network amongst the churches. There in Swindon is a, a real buzz now amongst some of the evangelical churches about church planting, which is really exciting to see. And we'd love to be able to see them come together and, and work together to be able to see um, many churches planted all over Swindon. Um, and another thing we're trying to do is uh, with our ABWE team, we're trying to bring together kind of a, a platform, a place where they can come and, and people can come that are going to be trained in those different le uh, levels of leadership to know what kind of training they need. If COVID didn't teach us anything, it did teach us that 
There is so many resources available all over the, the internet, all over that you have access to so much training. And instead of us reinventing the wheel, we're hoping to be able to find good training and bring it together into a, a, a platform for people on whatever level that is, whether it's a ministry leader, whether it's a, um, a growth group leader, whether it's a deacon, whether it's um, one of the elders that they would, could kind of come to that spot and be able to find what, what things should I be being trained in. Um, so that's something as a team, ABW team, we're trying to kind of bring together. And again, God has just been so incredibly faithful, uh, faithful in bringing up those leaders. Like we said, we've been praying and you were praying with us for, for God to raise up those leaders uh, in, in our church plant. And God has been faithful to do that. And again, because of his faithfulness in the past, we can trust him again to be faithful in the future to develop new leaders in the new location. And the last part of our uh, vision is to multiply healthy evangelical churches uh, in the United Kingdom. And uh, we've been involved as a team in, in doing that uh, over the years that we've been in England. Um, uh, North Swindon Baptist Church was planted in 1998 by the ABWE team. Uh, that's the mother church that we were planted from. Uh, and so our team was involved in seeing that church established and growing and healthy to the point that they grew uh, and needed to multiply. And uh, Cornerstone Church was birthed uh, from them, planted in, in 2013, um, and just graduated the, the Sunday before we came back on furlough, about a month ago, uh, was the last Sunday that we were, were there. Um, and so we are uh, looking forward to moving on to the next thing that God has for our family. And once again, we're looking... Um to plant a church again, we're looking in the area of Wichelstow, which Wichelstow is in the south side of Swindon. Swindon right now is the third fastest growing area in England. Uh, we, the, in Wichelstow, there's about 4,000 new homes that are going to be planted, or built, not planted, but built in that area uh, in different phases. So the phase, phase one is already complete. You can see that kind of on the top Left-hand corner is kind of the area of Wichelstow. Um, on the bottom where we're standing is where we're hoping to be able to plant that church. Um, and again, there wouldn't be any church buildings. No longer do they even set aside uh, land for church buildings. They don't even um, plan to build any uh, Church of England churches. There is no plans for churches. So there's a, a need for a, a gospel light there in a new community. And we're hoping to be able to, to be a part of that. Uh, there's also excitement that's happening um, amongst, like I said, the, the, the churches, the scope of, of church planting in Swindon is huge because they're not only building in the south side, they're going to be building on the east side as well, the eastern villages, and that's going to be 8,000 new homes uh, in the next couple of years. And so um, the, the mother church, North Swindon Baptist Church, is not only looking to plant one church, but also looking to plant several churches. And so there's an excitement that potentially we could be a part of multiple churches, um, helping them along the way to be able to plant those churches. So there's just a real excitement for church planting, for the excitement of what God's doing. He's doing something amazing in Swindon, and we're so excited to be able to be a part of that. And once again, like I said, God has been faithful. He has built these churches. He has grown them. He has um, allowed them to continue to be healthy. Um, he is uh, the one that's bringing this excitement about church planting as well. And so therefore, we can trust him in the future that he's going to help us as well to plant this church. And we have faith that he's going to help us plant a lot more churches, not just this one church. So we're just excited to be a part of it, kind of along the ride with, with the Lord as he's doing amazing work there. Uh, so I'm going to let, uh, allow Allie to go ahead and take a seat. And we have our uh, picture of our latest prayer card up on the screen there. They're back on our table. We'd love for you to take one, uh, put it up on your fridge, keep it in your Bible, whatever you do uh, with them. Uh, but we really do value your prayers. Um, and uh, our contact information is on the back, our website and things as well, uh, that you can get into contact uh, with us uh, from. And... Um, uh, now we're going to transition to, to looking at God's word together. If you have a Bible, go ahead and turn to Deuteronomy chapter 3. Deuteronomy chapter 3. Deuteronomy is the fifth book in the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, then Deuteronomy. And we're going to be looking at chapter 3 for our remaining time together. Um, as we think about the subject of confidence in God's faithfulness, we, we spoke about God's faithfulness uh, in our presentation of the way that God has been faithful uh, in the past and how we're trusting his faithfulness in uh, the future. And in Deuteronomy 3, we want to be thinking about this subject of God's faithfulness 
as well. Now, it might not be the first place you would think to turn if you were going to be thinking about God's faithfulness. It might not even be the first place you would turn at all in God's word. Um, sometimes uh, it might be a place that uh, uh, some people would avoid. But, um, but it's so rich. It's so helpful uh, for us as we um, uh, hear God speaking to uh, the nation of Israel through uh, Moses. And, and as we uh, think about God's faithfulness, uh, we, we need to ask the question, why should we trust God? Is, is it really worth trusting God? I mean, we live in a, in a world that is, um, in one of the songs, it talked about chaos, right? He brings our chaos back into order. Uh, we live in a world that is broken, uh, that is uh, uh, cursed by sin, uh, and as a result of that, all of us face all kinds of difficulties in this life, challenges, uh, whether it be financial or relational, uh, concerns with your health or uh, a work situation, uh, a loss of uh, a loved one, or maybe you're fearful and anxious about the future. There's all kinds of things. I mean, there, I'm sure there's, I could list a whole number of other things as well. But as you look at your life, I'm sure there are things that you look at and you think, how can I trust God's faithfulness as I'm facing these things in my life? Well, Israel was facing some challenges as we come to Deuteronomy chapter 3. Um, uh, just to, to bring us up uh, quickly to speed here, uh, they are the nation of Israel is on uh, the eastern shores of the Jordan River, uh, waiting for God's instructions to go into the promised land. And as they are preparing for that, Moses is speaking to uh, the nation. Um, uh, and this is after 40 years that they've just spent wandering around in the wilderness, a trip that should have taken them about two weeks. And for the last 40 years, they've been wandering around because of their disobedience to the Lord, their lack of trust in him. And in Deuteronomy chapters 1 through 3, Moses is giving a very brief history lesson to the people who are standing there getting ready to go into the promised land. To remind them how they had gotten to where they are and to encourage them for the future that lay, lie ahead of them. Uh, four things that we want to consider this morning. And the first is this. God has been faithful in the past. This is verses 1 to 11. I'm not going to read the passage just uh, for sake of time this morning. Um, but in those first 11 verses, uh, Moses is recounting the defeat of Og um, in uh, king, king of Bashan. I, I, at the end of chapter 2, he uh, recounts the defeat of uh, King Sion uh, as well. And the, the defeat of these two uh, kings uh, are uh, recounted by Moses to the people of Israel. This is something that's just happened in their very recent history. Uh, these are, they're actually standing in the land that they have just conquered. And as he recounts that, we see in verse 2 uh, that, it's the, that it was the Lord that had given them into their hands. The Lord said to me, do not fear him, that is Og, uh, King Og. Why? For I have given him and all of his people and his land into your hand, and you shall do to him as you did to sign the king of Amorite, the king of the Amorites, who lived at Heshbon. And this was a total victory. In verse four, we read that they took all of the cities, all of the cities. There was not a city that they did not take from them. Sixty cities, the whole region of that king. Now, as I was reading in Deuteronomy chapter 3, um, I, I was thinking about what comes in Deuteronomy chapter 1. As Moses is recounting their history, in chapter 1, beginning in verse 26, he speaks about uh, the event at Kadesh Barnea when the people of, of Israel did not trust the Lord. When they had sent those 12 spies into the land and they had spent 40 days looking at the land and they brought back some of the produce and they gave a report of the land. And 10 of the spies said, the land is great, but we shouldn't go in. And two of the spies said, the land is great and we should go in. We should trust the Lord. And this is what uh, Moses recounts, beginning in verse 26 of chapter 1 of Deuteronomy. He says, yet you would not go up, but rebelled against the command of the Lord your God. And you murmured in your tents and said, because the Lord hated us, he has brought us out of the land of Egypt to give us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us. Where are we going up? Our brothers have made our hearts melt, saying the people are greater and taller than we the cities are great and fortified up to heaven, and besides, we have seen the sons of the Anakim there. Then I said to them, uh, then I, I said to you, 
Do not be in dread or afraid of them. The Lord your God who goes before you will himself fight for you just as he did for you in Egypt before your eyes and in the wilderness where you have seen how the Lord your God carried you as a man carries his son all the way that you went until you came to this place. And notice what it says in verse 32. Yet in spite of this word, you did not believe the Lord your God. They didn't believe the Lord. They didn't trust him. They were afraid and they didn't go in. And in Deuteronomy chapter 3, I think Moses is trying to show them that God has already begun to uh, quench those fears that they had when they were at Kadesh Barnea. They're getting ready to go into the same land. The, the, the towns haven't changed. The people haven't changed. Those same fears are still there before them. But notice what he says. They were afraid that God was going to give them into the hands of the Amorites to destroy them. Look at verse 8. So we took the land at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan. That's the opposite. They said, God's giving them, they're going to destroy us. They destroyed completely those Amorite kings. Then they said that the cities are great and they're fortified. They have these big walls and there's no way we're going to be able to penetrate them. We read in verse 5. That these 60 cities in verse 4, they were fortified with high walls, gates, and bars, besides very un many unwalled villages. What happened? God had given them victory over these cities that had great walls with bars of iron, and, and they were fortified. And the people that lived in the land, they, they were bigger than we are. There were giants in the land, the sons of Anakim. Did, did you notice in verse 11... That Og, king of Bashan, we're told, was left of the remnant of the Rephaim. The Rephaim were the giants. He was a giant king. And there's this really peculiar uh, 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 fact here that is mentioned in verse 11. His bed was a bed of iron. It's nine cubits. It was nine cubits in length and four cubits in breadth. Now, I'm sure you're all really up to date on cubits. You probably use them to measure everything in your house. Um, but it's about 18 inches. And so this bed uh, was 13 and a half feet by six feet. That's a massive bed. And some uh, uh, scholars believe that this might have been his coffin that he was buried in. Why did he need such a big bed or such a big coffin? Because he was huge. And what had God done? Given them victory over this king. Those things they were afraid of at Kadesh Barnea, God has answered here. And I think Moses wants them to understand that as they're getting ready to go into the land. As I think about that, it reminds me that God has been faithful to us as well. He's been faithful to you. He's been faithful to this church, hasn't he? We can reflect on God's faithfulness in our own lives. We can reflect on God's faithfulness to this church. I think that's a really good thing to do. Because as we reflect on God's faithfulness in the past, it encourages us for the present. It encourages us for the future. How has God been faithful to you? So God's been faithful in the past is our first point. The second point is God has been faithful to keep his promises, verses 12 to 17. Uh, if we were to read there, there's a, a lot of uh, place names and things as Moses is uh, showing how the land was divided among two and a half of the tribes. So they had just beaten these two kings and two and a half of the tribes said, we want to live here. This is where we want our land to be. The land was really good for pasturing animals and they had lots of animals and they said, this is the land that we want. Now, uh, Moses uh, begins to um, divvy out the land. In fact, in your Bible, if you have maps in the back, things that you probably never look at, um, most Bibles that have maps in the back, not all Bibles do, so if you don't have one, if you're on a device, you, you won't probably have the maps there, uh, you will find a, a, a map of the division of the land to the 12 tribes of Israel. And on the east side of the Jordan, you will see the land that was given to those two and a half uh, tribes. Uh, to the Reubenites, to the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh. Two individuals, Jair and Makir, in verses 14 and 15, are singled out, I think, because of their role in taking particular areas. And I think they were there as examples to the people. That there is blessing when you trust the Lord. There is blessing. God will give the land to you if you trust him. But I think it also shows that God is keeping his promises. He had promised to give them the land and they're beginning to take possession of it already. This is part of the promised land. 
God is faithful to his promises. As we reflect in his word, he makes all kinds of promises to us. Not only can we reflect on his faithfulness, we can reflect on his faithfulness to keep his promises. God never fails to keep his promises. Again, that should encourage our hearts this morning. God is faithful to his promises. <coughs> Thirdly, not only has God been faithful in the past, but God will be faithful in the future. Verses 18 to 22. In this section, Moses is reminding those two and a half tribes of their commitment to go with their brothers into the land of Canaan. Uh, there is a danger now that they have possession of the, their land that they would just let their brothers go on over and they would sit there and settle and have a nice time. In fact, it was one of the reasons Moses didn't want to give them land to begin with. But they said, no, no, we will send our men over with them and we will fight with our brothers until they take possession. He's just saying, just remember that. You see, the unity and solidarity of God's people was absolutely important. It was crucial for the nation. It's no less crucial for us as God's people. We have brothers and sisters in Christ that we are united to because they are in Christ. And we ought to be here to support one another. When we go through those challenges, economic, financial, health concerns, job concerns, family concerns, relational concerns, we ought to be here for one another. You aren't alone. Not only is God with you, but you have brothers and sisters who are with you as well. It's why it's so important to be a part of a church family. It's why it's so important to be engaged in coming along uh, on Sundays uh, and other times that, that the church meets together. Because you need that. You need it in your growth, for your good, for your encouragement. To keep pressing on when you're going through those difficulties. It's great to be able to be in a room where other Christians are singing out praise to God, being reminded of who he is. And maybe when you can't sing those songs yourself, you hear your brothers and sisters singing them. It's the truth of God being spoken to you. It's so important. But it's also an encouragement to, to Joshua, who's going to be taking the place of, of Moses in verses 21 and 22. And I commanded Joshua at that time, your eyes have seen all that the Lord your God has done to these two kings. He's saying, look at what God just did. So will the Lord do to all the kingdoms into which you are crossing. You shall not fear them, for it is the Lord your God who fights for you. Doesn't that sound like what Moses had tried to encourage the people with that we just read in chapter 1 when they were at Kadesh Barnea saying, Joshua, don't be like them. Now Joshua was one of those two spies who said, we should go in. The land is great and God is with us and we should go in and take possession of it. And he's saying now that they're getting ready to go in, he's saying, Joshua, remember, look at what God just did. God's going to do the same thing. Just keep trusting him. He will be faithful in the future. Because God will fight for you. <clears throat> it reminds me of an, an, a math equation. I don't, I don't know if you enjoy math or not. Um, I do. Uh, but the equation God plus you equals a majority is, is a math equation you should know. You see, the reality is if, if you are with God, you're in the majority, even if you're in the minority. And sometimes we need to be reminded of that, don't we? I mean, we feel very much in the minority when we live as Christians in the UK. As I mentioned, only 3% of the people are Christians. And that can be discouraging as people go into work. Maybe they're the only Christian in their workplace. Maybe they're only Christian in their school. Maybe in their neighborhood. Maybe in their family. They need to be reminded that following God is worth it. That if you're with him, you're on the winning side. That he will fight for you. In 2 Kings chapter uh, 6, there, there's a, an account, I'll just read a few verses um, uh, from 2 Kings 6, of Elisha's servant. Uh, an account uh, of Elisha's servant in 2 Kings chapter 6, beginning in verse 15. Because he needed to be reminded of this truth as well. 
says, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city. And the servant said, alas, my master, what shall we do? I mean, we're surrounded. We, there's no hope. We're in trouble. He looked around and they're surrounded by the enemy. How does Elisha respond? He, he said, do not be afraid. Hmm. Seems like there's a theme here. Do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Now, if I was Elisha's servant, I'd be thinking, Elisha, I think you've lost your mind. Okay, maybe you've woken up a little groggy. Uh, maybe you had something bad to eat. I don't know. But if you look out the doors, there are people all around us and there's horses and chariots. Uh, we are outnumbered. What do you mean there are more with us than there are with them? And notice what Elisha does in verse 17. He says, it says, then Elisha prayed and he said, oh Lord, please open his eyes so that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. See, the truth was that they had the majority. The problem was that the servant couldn't see that. And sometimes we don't see that in our lives. And we need to be reminded. We need to have God open our spiritual eyes to see that he is with us. That we are not alone, that we are uh, together, that he is the one who protects us. See, when we fix our eyes on him, everything else seems small. Whatever your problem, whatever challenge it is that you're facing right now, often the thing, that's the thing that dominates your vision. It's the thing that dominates your heart, and you can't think about anything else. And it's huge. But when you begin to take a look at the Lord and you focus your eyes on him, put the Lord next to that thing, and all of a sudden that thing doesn't seem so big anymore. It doesn't mean it's not significant. It doesn't mean it doesn't matter. I'm just saying it's not as big as it was before. Is there something ahead of you that's causing you to fear? You can trust God for the future. There's no need to be afraid because he is faithful. So God has been faithful in the past. God's been faithful to keep his promises. He will be faithful in the future. Lastly, he will be faithful to keep his promises. This is verses 23 through the end of the chapter. And in, in these verses, Moses is praying to God and he's asking God to let him go into the promised land. Now he's been barred because of his um, sin at um, uh, striking a rock. You can, you can read about that in Numbers chapter 20. And so he was prevented from going into the promised land. But he's pleading, he's begging God, please let me go in. Please let me go in. But God says no. In fact, he says, don't speak to me about this. Uh, again, uh, we're finished. We're finished talking about this. So it's kind of like a kid who keeps asking their parent for something, right? Dad, please, dad, please, dad, please, dad, please. And then eventually, no, that is it. That, that's where, where God is. Moses understands that. And so Moses charges uh, Joshua with the task of leading the people into the promised land. There's going to be a transition of leadership. And it's going to be a big one. From Moses to Joshua. And Moses is preparing the people for that. So that they will follow Joshua as they have followed him. I, I mentioned in the last point that our view of God is really important. When we have a big view of God, everything else seems small. I just want to conclude by something in, in Moses' prayer that really struck me. In verses 24. In verse 24. O oh Lord God, you have only begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven or on earth who can do such works and mighty acts as yours? As Moses prays and asks to, to go into the land, do you see his vision of God? He, he says, God, you're just getting started. That's why he wants to go into the promised land. He's like, I, I want to I see this through. I want to see what else you're going to do. That's pretty ama amazing for him to say, you've only begun to show your servant what you're going to do. Because just think about all the things that Moses got to see in his lifetime. I mean, Moses was rescued in this little basket that floated down the river by Pharaoh's daughter, and he was raised in Pharaoh's house. Moses was spoken to by God from a bush that was burning but didn't consume. And he was called to go and to tell Pharaoh to let his people go. 
he got to see the ten plagues that God sent on the nation of Egypt. The point that they said, go away. And as they were being pursued with the Red Sea in front of them, Moses held up his staff over that Red Sea and it was divided and they walked across on dry land. And then the waves came over the Egyptian army and drowned the rest of them. They then went to Mount Sinai where God met with Moses and he gave him the Ten Commandments. He wrote on those stones with his own hand and Moses held them in his hand. Moses was there up on the mountain. And he was there when God led them by a pillar of of cloud and a pillar of fire. When he provided manna every single day when they would walk out and it would just be on the ground and quail and water from rocks. And victory over their enemies. That's a lot of stuff. In fact, some of you are probably thinking, Man, I'd like to just, you know, maybe have one of those things. Maybe I could see the burning bush and we go outside and God could talk to me from a bush. Or maybe, maybe just one of the plagues. That would be pretty crazy to see something like that. Or maybe I could go up on a mountain and God would talk to me. And yet he says, God's just getting started. When we think of God's faithfulness. He's just getting started. We've been encouraged by what God has done through the time that we've been in England, and we're looking forward to what he's going to do as we continue to trust him. You can have confidence in God's faithfulness. That should strengthen and encourage you as his people. If you have any doubt about that, all you have to do is look at the cross where he won the greatest victory that we've been reminded of this morning as we've taken communion. Where Satan was defeated, our sin was defeated, death was defeated, and we're promised eternity with him in heaven. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for the way that that encourages our heart as we think about your character. As we've been reminded this morning of your character. We thank you for your faithfulness. Your past faithfulness. How that encourages us in the present to trust you. And as we look to the future, with with all the things before us, with the things that we're facing right now, the challenges and difficulties in our life, we can know that we can have confidence in you because you are faithful. Thank you for your faithfulness. Help us, like Moses, to have a big vision of you as we read about you in your word, as we live in relationship with you. Encourage our hearts, strengthen our faith that we might walk with you into the unknown in the future, knowing that our eternity has been settled and will be with you forever. Thank you. Thank you for your faithfulness. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you, Allie. I'm going to let you guys slide out and head back to your table. And You guys want to join them or not? It's up to you. Yeah, okay. Um, I just want to say, man, it's great to see Jimmy and Nina and little William. I'm excited to see him today. Not everybody jump on them at once, right? I always try to say that. And uh, But we're glad and we're... We're excited for the new addition to your home and also to our church. And so we've been praying for you guys and are excited for you. Hope that you've been encouraged by what Cliff shared this morning. Uh, Not only the report of England, how God's working over there, but also the challenge for us and the challenge of how, how are we viewing God? How do you see God? How do you see him working And it reminds me of uh, the passage in Romans, and we're going to get there soon, but it kind of hits on that. And what shall we say of these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also with him graciously give us all things? That doesn't mean he's going to give us all things that we want. That means he's going to give us all things that we need. And regardless of where you are, regardless of your circumstances, regardless of whatever is laid on the plate before you, God is faithful and he will give you exactly what you need. Will you trust him? Will you follow him? Will you walk with him?
Will you stand with me and let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, we are grateful for your faithfulness. We're thankful that we can be reminded of your character and part of your character is your faithfulness. Lord, we have seen, Lord, of your mercy. We've, we've bore witness of your love uh, in the fact that you gave your son Jesus and we celebrated his giving of his life for us. We remembered that. And Lord, we've also been encouraged, encouraged with your word and the truth of, uh, of your word going forth and will not return void. We're thankful for the, the, the ministry there in England and the, the way that you continue to use Cliff and Allison and their children and Lord, their team there in ABWE there in England. We pray that you would continue to bless them and continue to raise up um, uh, the leaders around them, that they may go forth and to plant these churches in these areas where people need the good news of Jesus Christ. Lord, it challenges me to think about our lives and what are we doing and how are we living? How are we being intentional with what you're calling us to do? Lord, sometimes we're, we're timid. Sometimes we're afraid and we're scared. Um, to say something or to do something, Lord, that would show your love or to share your love. And yet, Lord, I pray that you would give a boldness and a strength to us as we live our lives this week, knowing that you are a God who does not hold back from your children. You desire exactly what we need to give it to us. And yet, Lord, in that giving, you want us to rely upon not ourselves and not even those means, those things. You want us to trust in you. And so may we see you do great and wonderful and awesome things this week as we trust in you. Help us to be faithful to you. Lord, thank you for being faithful to us. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. God's blessing on you. Hope you have a great week.